feels like one that you can kind of tick off. But when you start to look into it, you realize that it's all those subtle little things that really make a difference. Great, so a very warm welcome uh, to you. Uh, my name is Virinaga. I'm here at the Brixton Buddhist Community and I'm here tonight with Amla Dana and a few other friends as well. And uh, tonight's Dharma Night class is going to be uh, on um, perfect speech or the ideal of human communication. And the, um, uh, that comes from a Sanskrit word uh, called samyak vacha, uh, samyak vacha, which means perfect speech or perfect uh, voice. And uh, it's part of our series exploring the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which is a Buddhist, a very ancient Buddhist teaching, which in a certain way lays out the um, acts of a transformation in a way. Uh, the teaching goes, if we want to be free from uh, the sufferings and the um, uh, difficulties we experience in life, we could practice this Noble Eightfold Path and gradually transform ourselves to uh, a place uh, where we no longer uh, feel those, um, well, this kind of vicissitudes of life in a way. So uh, yeah, this is week three of this eight week series. And um, the first week, uh, um, Amra Pushpa talked about perfect vision. Uh, and that is um, uh, sort of where, in a certain way, in order to transform yourself, you need to know where you're going. You need to know what the ideal is. You need to know what uh, you're striving for in a way, what you're working towards. So the first part of the Noble Eightfold Path is perfect vision. And uh, Maitre Nita last week talked about emotion, uh, a perfect emotion or uh, kind of positive, uh, en positive energy in a way. And uh, this is where, um, you know, having had that vision, one needs to, the, uh, sort of, uh, the idea isn't enough. You need to get behind it with your, uh, or with your heart, with your will, with your energy. Uh, so um, yeah, perfect emotion is the next stage or the next aspect of this path. And now we come on to the third aspect, which is uh, speech. And yeah, out of eight, eight kind of aspects or eight components, eight facets of this path, it's no coincidence that speech is number three. Um, it's considered a very uh, integral key part of Buddhist practice. I mean, they're all important, but particularly uh, it, this, this speech's position as number three is, uh, well, is quite relevant in a way. Um, often in sort of Buddhist, Buddhism or Buddhist practice, we talk um, in terms of being wholehearted. Uh, we often, uh, you might have heard the phrase with body, speech and mind. So the idea being that we do it wholeheartedly. And um, yeah, we, we're probably familiar with the kind of sense of the body or the sense of actions, uh, you know, doing things. Uh, uh, with with heart and also with you've got the mind which is uh, you know us thinking of um well, being clear-minded in a way, knowing what we're doing. But you've got this position of speech in between the two of them as a sort of mediator. So the speech, in a way, the communication is how we go about uh, interacting with the world around us. So not only do we have an internal experience, we start to relate to things outside of us as well through our communication. And uh, yeah, communication is, if you like, I mean, you might even go as far as saying communication is the, one of the defining features of, of humans, in a way, human nature. Of course, you have other, other um, creatures which communicate with one another as well, don't you? But it's, you know, it's associated with intelligence and with a higher level of consciousness than, than a, a creature or an animal that maybe isn't so uh, conscious of its environment, not so aware of its environment. So. Um, animals which tend to be, have a higher level of consciousness uh, are the animals which communicate more. And we, if you like humans, as uh, the most conscious um, creature, I mean, maybe you could argue dolphins are somewhere up there as well, but uh, you know, the most conscious creature have um, very high levels of communication. We are the talking ape, aren't we, it's been said. So, yeah, so you have this idea of speech being really critical, really critical part of human nature and human engagement, how we relate and how we interact with the world around us. Uh, but particularly as a spiritual practice, um, uh, there's quite a lot to it in a way, uh, which is really interesting. So um, a lot of the um, material that I'm talking about tonight comes out of a book by uh, Bhante Sangrashta, the founder of True Atna. Uh, he's got a book called Vision and Transformation on the Noble Eightfold Path. But he really talks about um, the, the, the practice of uh, perfect speech or refining our speech, improving our speech and communication uh, in terms of 
um, four levels or four aspects of speech. And uh, these are actually directly taken from a set of Buddhist ethical principles. So if you're a Buddhist practitioner, you try to live uh, ethically, you try to live uh, in, a, in, in a sort of good way, uh, a positive way. And there's a couple of different lists of these. Um, you might, if, you're a, if you've been practicing Buddhism for a while, you might be familiar with a list of the five ethical precepts, of which one of those precepts is about speech, uh, truthful communication. But there's actually a list of 10 uh, of these as well, uh, which um, if, you're, if you decide to become an ordained member of the True Vietnam Buddhist Order, like Amaladana and myself, uh, you live by, you take these 10 ethical principles, uh, ethical precepts, uh, four of which relate to speech. Uh, they are uh, truthful speech, uh, kind speech, helpful speech, and harmonious speech. So I'll go into those uh, each in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to say um, something around um, the principle is easy, the practice is hard. You know, it's very, in a certain way, it's quite straightforward to, um, uh, to get, get a grip on how one's speech might be better. But the practice of it is extremely difficult and subtle uh, and it's extremely challenging. Um, hopefully I'll draw that out for you over the next few minutes. So, yeah, truthful speech. Um, so... Yeah, each of these precepts are kind of set out in terms of a positive and a negative. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, the positive form of this is being truthful with one speech. And the sort of opposite of that would be to not lie, to not um, uh, mislead or so on. Yeah, we can probably all understand that that was generally a good thing to be truthful. And a lot of people might say, well, I don't lie very much. Uh, you know, I don't I don't lie in my speech. But um, the actual practice of refining one's uh, speech or communication is, uh, yeah, of course, there's much more subtle levels to that. So you may not lie in your speech. But do you exaggerate? You know, do you sort of slightly elaborate your stories to make them a little bit more interesting? You know, uh, I certainly do that. I love a good story. So it's very easy for me to kind of slightly expand uh, what I'm saying, you know, expand the numbers a bit or whatever, or be a bit casual with it. So what we're particularly looking for in our communication is what Bante calls an accuracy of narration. So are we really, really narrating our story accurately in a way and you've also got um, as well as sort of your your maybe casual exaggerations you've also got things like omissions like do we try and make ourselves look a bit better by omitting certain little bits of information that maybe don't paint us in such a good light um, so yeah so part of being truthful in our speech is to not omit the, uh, omit those things that we maybe don't want to say to people uh, I guess you could also say that's sort of like owning up to stuff as well or something like that so you can already see that with truthful communication, in the principle simple, isn't it? Be truthful. The practice is quite hard. You know, we're looking at all those subtle little things that we do in our speech to present things, to sort of spin things in a certain way. So the, uh, the part, of, part of working on our, in a, in a certain way, part of embarking on this eightfold path of transformation is to take a good look at these little things that we do and try to basically be honest with ourselves. We're not doing it for the sake of being seen to be good or anything. It's very much about transforming ourselves. And if we're honest with ourselves and we're sincere with ourselves, gradually, gradually, we will um, we'll notice a change in our, in our kind of, um, kind of in a certain way, our psychological state. I guess all of these little exaggerations and little things aren't so significant in and of themselves, but you know, often it can be a slippery slope, can't it? If we get used to making a little exaggerations, well, it's very easy to make more and very, you know, and then maybe a little bit bigger and so on. But if we, if we really hold a principle of ourselves, well, um, we can't but help refine our, our kind of uh, minds a little bit, you know, refine our minds and uh, uh, sort of think and act out of, a, out of a cleaner place, a more straightforward place. So that's truthful speech. Um, just to, you know, it's a very good, uh, I like that one because it's a very good illustration, but I'll also just tell you the other areas as well um, that Bante talks about, or well, are the ethical principles. Uh, you also, if you're embarking on this, um, on this path of transformation, you also want to try to aspire to speak kindly. So uh, being not, not being unkind in our communication. So an example of this, uh, Bante talks about it in terms of uh, speaking with love speaking with love. So I sort of think of this as, um, 
you know, it's so easy to tell our story, isn't it, and to communicate what we want, but uh, are we taking in the other person? You know, are we aware of what we're saying uh, is affecting them? You know, uh, it, there can be a little bit of a trade-off here with truthful communication, can't there? So sometimes, you know, we might want to sort of speak the truth in a way, but we, we're aware that it can be unkind. The, the other person might find that quite heart, hurtful. So, of course, we need to bear both of those in mind. We need to find a way of uh, saying what's true, but in a way which is also kind and caring and not kind of, um, uh, not kind of undermining or attacking of them, not hurtful. So there's kind speech. And then there's helpful speech. Do we speak helpfully with our, with our, with our speech? Um, and so this is really like, are we having a positive effect with our speech? You know, or are we, you know what it's like, you, you, take a, you might want to take a subtle dig at somebody or undermine them slightly or make a slightly cutting comment. Uh, you know, is that helpful? Um, I mean, yeah, probably not in a way, probably not, you know. Uh, do we want to speak um, helpfully? And I think this can also include things like gossip or teasing or, um, yeah, making fun of in a way. Um, is that helpful? I mean, I used to work in a, in a lab where everyone would gather every lunchtime and basically gossip about each other, you know, uh, or, you know, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. And I found it really sort of a bit distasteful in a way. I just sort of stopped, I stopped engaging with it. Either I'd not have lunch with them or I'd have lunch with them and just sort of, let it wash over me and not respond in a way. And it, of course, it would quickly fall flat. Um, so, you know, is the speech being helpful? Uh, I, by the way, I think I should add, there's definitely a place for having fun and having a laugh. I think you do need a sense of humour in a way and a bit of playfulness. But I think that is helpful. I think playfulness can put people at ease and, you know, develop friendship and develop communication. But it's like, is it coming, you know, there's a fine line, isn't there, between playfulness and kind of, being a bit pokey or trying to undermine a bit. So yeah, is it helpful? And then finally, and Bante says that these are um, in a way the most refined, they're sort of like different levels in a way. The most refined version is uh, harmonious speech. Is our speech harmonious? And what he means by this is, um, does it bring people together? Uh, you know, does it, um, I guess the opposite would be, does it divide, does it polarize? Uh, does it bring people together? Um, and I, I can hardly resist but bringing in, the, bringing in the US election at this point, which I think is a picture perfect example of that. On one hand, you've got um, Donald Trump, who's definitely a man who polarizes, seems to intend, uh, intend to polarize and divide. And then you've got um, Joe Biden, of course, and one of his first speeches he gave was that when he, I think he said something like, we're not Democrats or Republicans, we're Americans you know, trying to unify. Uh, so I think that's in a certain way a very good example of harmonious speech. Are we seeking to bring people together, even if we don't agree? By the way, it's not about agreeing with people. You don't have to be nicey-nicey, but you, you definitely don't want to purposefully divide and purposefully split people. So there are the four, um, the four levels, the four uh, kind of principles of speech that we, we may want to work on in this area of um, yeah, perfect speech. Uh, also, I think it's important to bear in mind that we've got all that online communication as well. You know, all that typing, all those message boards, all those WhatsApp messages and Zoom calls, that is very much definitely in the remit of this ethical practice of speech in a way, uh, speaking perfectly. So yeah, um, it's very easy, isn't it, to get behind, when you're behind the safety of your keyboard, it's very easy to throw out whatever you think in a way. Uh, unmediated, but are you really considering how that's going to be received by the person reading it? So I think if you're interested in Buddhism or practicing Buddhism, that area also needs to be considered. And then there's also sort of non-verbal or non-word non related communication. So sign, the things we communicate through signs and symbols. I think of art maybe as an example of this. What are we communicating with our art perhaps that we do if we if we do engage in that are we refining people's states of mind or are we trying to bring them down um, and then even body language as well completely non-verbal communication how are we communicating with our bodies are we friendly and open or are we closed and uh, tight is it helpful or not and then even actually there was one final thing i just wanted to say that in this book 
Bhante talks about the Vajrayana tradition, which is a, 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 a sort of mystical tradition of Buddhism, which uh, definitely very much held that mind-to-mind communication was possible, that you could sort of indirectly communicate with another, another being's mind. And whether you think that's a bit fanciful or not, I was thinking about um, well, the sort of presence that you can have in certain spaces. Like if you walk into a Buddhist center and you're in the shrine room or going, in, going into a church, for instance, there may not be anyone in there, but it, the room has a presence, doesn't it? Through all the meditation that's happened there, all the prayer, all the worship, there's something that's been almost imparted into the walls of the building that is a communication of some way. So I just wondered if that might be an ex, a sort of example of a more direct form of communication that we might be able to get a handle on. My first, I remember reading it for the first time thinking, um, really, I wanted to get onto perfect awareness, actually. I mm. was sort of whiz through all the steps and go to the mm. which sounded sort of uh, more interesting. And mm. I thought speech was going to be fairly straightforward. Um, but I was, I was I think the thing that I really liked is the way that Banti uh, mentioned the four levels mm. and the way he described them as progressive, you know, and, and, and how it just got more and more f- f- um, refined as, as we went through the four levels. Mm. Um, and I liked his humour as well in the book. You know, he, when, it, when he was talking about you know the, the exaggeration, which, as you say, we all do. You mm. know, we can't. Okay, it yeah. always, it's almost impossible yeah, yeah. not to not not to do it. Um, but how how you're saying that you know when you when he was giving a speech and there were sort of three or four hundred people there, and he was, but the report said there were sort of you know thousands of people. Um, and he said, if there's you know, if it's, if it's, um, three or four hundred people there, say there's three or four hundred people. Mm. And, if, and if, uh, if someone else is talking and there's thousands of people there, don't say there are three or four hundred. Mm. <laughs> and I thought it was really, and, but it's just what we do, isn't it? It's almost mm. automatic. We, we tend to um, um, colour you know, our, 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 our recounting of events mm. based upon how we want it to sound and it's mm. it's almost like it's it's, it's almost um, as if we're encouraged to do that mm. you, know, in, you know particularly if you know in a work environment where you're asked how you know ha- how your company performs or something you, you, you've got to sort of big it up you know yeah. and and your, with your competition you've got to minimize it mm. but it, and it just goes through virtually everything Mm. We do, isn't mm. it? Well, you only have to look at the advertising industry, don't you? Which is a whole oh. massive industry built on that. That, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that in a certain way, it's a really good metaphor for the spiritual life generally. I mean, the practice of speech, because mm. just like you're saying, it's, it feels like one that you can kind of tick off, but when you start to look into it, you realise that it's all those subtle little things that really make a difference. You know, it's sort of like, in a certain way, the Dharma is really straightforward, isn't it? You know, just like practice, be kind, work on your mind, you know, Mm. develop mindfulness. Easy to explain, Mm. quite hard to do, you know. And as you, you, as we go through these four steps, you realise also that um, it's not a limb on its own, is it? It's not Mm. a step on its own. Mm. You know, know, I mean, awareness is key, actually, talking talking about awareness, it's... uh, it's key that we have that, isn't it? Mm. And, it's, and it's so important that we, I mean, I think um, one of the other things that Bantu drew out in the truthfulness was that we need to be aware of us, you know, be clear about our own, uh, where we're coming from, mm. what, we're, what we're trying to communicate. Mm. Uh, and often we talk, um, this is something you know, I have personal difficulty. I, t- I, know I tend to sort of rattle on about things, and and uh, mm. and it's t- quite difficult to be uh, considered about what you're saying, and, mm. you know, and 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 to actually, you know, um, then, and then you know, as you say, you move on to the kindly speech. The, mm. uh, the way again, he introduces that. I love the way he first of all talks about being aware of what we're you know, of our own, where we're coming from, ourselves, mm. and then he says, but we also, you know, in in, in communication, there is another person, mm. uh, and we need to be aware of who we're talking to and how it's going to impact them mm. you know mm. and, and, and it's a lovely sort of segue into in, into into kindly speech mm. um, and that brings in the you know, whole idea of meta you know mm. and, and awareness of other people mm. and, and the fact that it is a two-way thing mm. I, I that's it and i think that it's sort of in a way it's in the book but you could draw it up much more couldn't you that idea of the transformative aspect is that considering of others, mm-hmm. you know, because by nature communication always involves someone else. But how often do we are we just saying what we want to say yeah. about us, or because we want a certain thing to happen, mm-hmm. and we're communicating out of that place? And like, and we also hear what we want to hear, don't we? That's true. So, so, yeah. so you know, so, so, so we close so, our ears to things we don't like. I think yeah. he has this expression, doesn't he, in the book about. Um, 
um, a, co a mutual conversation between pro projections, you know, because each person is talking, thinking of things from how they want to see mm. the, uh, the, the conversation going, and actually, it's a, you can have quite an unreal conversation. Mm. It's rather radical, actually, isn't it, when you when you really start taking in another. Mm. Uh, I mean, even. In pre preparation for this talk, there was a bit of a line in there about, um, I think it was kindly speech. You even talked about taking people in when mm. you're talking to them. Mm. And I was thinking, oh, God, I'm really bad at that. Yeah. Like, you know, I'll be talking to somebody while I'm emptying the dishwasher or whatever, stacking plates or, you know, I mean, cleaning up and just not really looking at people, yeah. you know, looking anywhere but them, you know, and talking away. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, God, I've just got to, I've just got to attend to people more more whole, wholeheartedly when I'm communicating, you know. Yeah, that's how it's, how it's so demanding, reading through it. It gets, it gets more and more demanding, doesn't it? Then, then mm. you could talk about um, um, a helpful speech. Mm. Um, and uh, he's this expression, doesn't he, in terms of the spiritual, uh, in a spiritual uh, environment, about, you know, you, you should be trying to raise the consciousness of their being. Mm. That's sort of slightly demanding, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about the gas bill or something, yeah. you know, you're, oh, well, you're, yeah, you're yeah. shopping or... That's yeah. why I prefixed by saying the spiritual environment, <laughs> yeah. because there's... Yeah, but, but, it, but it does sort of show how... I mean, you know, I remember, actually, when I was reading it, I remembered... Um, um, I was talking to Michelle Bandu once, and, and I had this sort of um, tendency to... Um, be quite negative about myself sometimes mm. and I, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about but I use the expression it serves me right mm. you know which is quite a, quite a sort of self-flagellating sort of statement isn't it mm. and, he, and, and he said no it doesn't <laughs> you know and, 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 and he just said you, you did that because you know he explained why I did it and, and, mm. and, and says, of course it doesn't serve you right mm. and, 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 it, and he actually used in the way he said it I can hear it right now mm. um, it, it was really helpful because I still remember it and I still mm. remember my tendency when I say things like that not to not you know to be to be not not to be go be down on myself so it really mm. helped me in that respect mm. but also the way he said it I mean I can imagine someone saying something like that and me mm. sort of reacting to it because it's like a, an instruction not to do something but mm. it was the way he said it, it was clearly out of concern mm. well yeah it's a very good example of helpful communication isn't mm. it but it just makes me think that there is a kind of whatever you're saying whatever even if you are talking about getting the shopping done or whatever there's always the potential there for a spiritual conversation or to take it deeper mm. you know like how often have i or you know it's so easy to stay on a surface level with one's communication with one's friends isn't it and it just takes someone to take a bit of a risk you know and go a bit deeper then you can start to have a more genuine communication you know and i mean it's good to it's fine having those sort of superficial conversations to get you started but mm. at some point one needs to take it deeper just like much bandy saying mm. you're just saying a sort of um a sort of common phrase, weren't you? Yeah. You know, and he just decided to take it a bit deeper, you know, make it a spiritual or a helpful conversation. Yeah, I, I like what you said about, um, um, you know, we, we still need to have fun, you know, we do, mm. we do need chit chat and things, but, but, mm. but we, we also need depth, don't we? We need, mm. we need, we need both. Um, and I think, uh, I think what, we're, what we're saying then is that, is that we, um, you know, hopefully we, want to, we, we don't want to forget the depths in our conversations and, mm. and the potential for you know, um, making really fruitful uh, interchange. Mm. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, th th there's that potential in most conversations in a way. And it's mm. just knowing when to, mm. when to step in. I mean, there's so much here, isn't there? I mean, I just realised that, mm. you know, even though I've been practising Buddha for a while now, there's so much more I could do with my speech in a way, you know, mm. I could work, I could keep working on my speech for, well, for decades, decades yeah. to come. I mean, and, and, and it, as I said, it, it, does, it does involve other things and more, more than anything, it involves other people, doesn't it? Mm. And, and, and I, I realised that, we, again, reading it again before this evening, how, um, yeah, how, how easy it is just to be self-oriented in, in conversation. Mm. Uh, and, well, inter interaction with other people, and, and, and how, how how much more um, enjoyable it is to, to take the other person in, mm. um, and to be and, and, and to try to raise uh, the game for both of you, really. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, but not not being um, you know t mm. too thoughtful and not having fun all the time. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, it just made me think it's a bit of a shared endeavour. Yes, we've got to work yeah. on our own speech, but 
we can work together on it, you know. And I guess that's the, why you'd have a sort of Buddhist community, isn't it? You know, one of the reasons is to support one another with things like this, in a way. You know, and I guess help. why it's so challenging, it must be quite challenging in a Buddhist community as well, because of that, you know, because of that, um, um, you know, we need to speak, don't we? We need to speak all the time, for, you know, for, for just, uh, and, and you, 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 I suppose you're, um, uh, if, if you're always talking to other people who are, who are trying to um, speak more skillfully, mm. um, then if you don't do that, you're, you're going to be picked. it's going to be quite noticeable, I suppose. And that's that's right. quite difficult. Yeah, but, but it's very good feedback, isn't it? You know, yeah. yeah, very good feedback. Well, I'm more of time, so we should probably start to wrap up. But thank you very much. I really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, it's mm. good. Great. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, Dharma Night talk. Uh, so if you did enjoy it, if you're enjoying our videos, I just want to ask you or encourage you to think about making a donation to the Brixton Buddhist community. Uh, we're a UK charity that relies completely on your donations to uh, run everything here. And uh, yeah, if you, this was a class, a meditation class, there'd be a donation bowl that you could just put in £10 at the end of the night uh, to help support the activities. But as you're watching this online, uh, well, I just want to th ask you to think about making an online donation. If you've watched uh, four or five videos this month, uh, maybe you might want to think about giving uh, £10. Uh, so there's a link in the description below where you can go to our website and make a donation. And if you don't want to, if you want to keep giving, you don't want to worry about uh, making that donation every month, well, you could just set us up a standing order, a monthly standing order. Uh, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, yeah, I want to suggest something of the region of maybe 10 or £20 a month. Uh, if you're uh, able to do that. And that would be really, really helpful and help us keep producing videos like this one. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourself.